My name is Carol Chen, like uh, mentioned, and um, I'd like to talk about meetups. And I think it was a nice kind of segue from your talk because you mentioned a little bit about your experiences with meetups. And uh, although I've been focusing more on like from the organizer perspective, what you can do and the things you can watch out for to create uh, success, successful meetups for your community. All right, I'm so used to just using arrow keys that I forgot this. Okay, so. Since I have almost like an hour session, uh, for once I can um, spend some time to bore you with a, a bit more details about myself. Um, I'm, I started after graduating, actually I started as an intern in Nokia um, when I was doing my uh, graduate school. And uh, so I was in Nokia for eight and a half years. I did a whole range of mostly technical roles from, I started with QE, on the S30 and S40 devices, who remembers those dump phones? Uh, you know, those are like really solid and uh, dependable devices, and we sold millions of those. So, you know, testing was really crucial to make sure everything was working right. So, I started with that, then moved on to development of the um, video engine in Symbian phones. Um, so, that was like a, a big part of my career in Nokia. And um, I moved on to multimedia integration, where I integrated video telephony and multimedia sharing to, again, Symbian S60 phones. And finally, last part of my Nokia career, I focused on developer environments, which are actually the SDKs where like, third party um, de uh, de developers or community developers use to develop Symbian apps. So um, yeah, from testing to integration to everything in between, and, uh, but I've never really connected or interacted with outside developers all that much, even though I was myself a developer. So at the end of that, um, as I had to leave Nokia due to certain changes, um, I decided to you know, explore different um, kind of career paths. I know I wanted to stay in the industry, but do something different. So I, I actually started organizing meetups since I got laid off by Nokia. I had a bit of free time and uh, I organized local meetups in uh, Finland where I was based. So uh, that kind of um, helped me to network, which we'll touch on a little bit more later on, some of the reasons why you might want to help organize meetups. And um, you know, so I managed to uh, get to know a lot of people and uh, learn different projects they are working on and uh, managed to uh, get an uh, opportunity to work for this company called Yolla, which is a small startup in Finland that develops a lin Linux-based uh, mobile operating system called Sailfish OS. Does anybody know or have heard of? Oh, cool. All right. Great. So um, I actually told the people who um, uh, part of the company say that um, I, I was a developer, but I don't want to do that anymore, but I want to kind of keep um, in that, uh, how to say, uh, in, in that interaction with the developers. So could I kind of go into developer advocacy, you know, community relations type of role? And uh, it's, it's a startup. You, you just like kind of define what you do. I, I had the chance to do everything from, you know, like localization, translating stuff to uh, helping with the testing and of course, I built kind of this role for the company, this developer relations, community relations role. Um, so it was very exciting. Um, I was thrown into organizing Yola's presence at N MWC, this huge mobile event um, in 2013. Like previously in Nokia, I was always envious of my uh, product marketing colleagues who went to these cool events and uh, you know get to talk to people and show off our phones and software and everything and I'm just behind the computer you know working on the code and now I'm like the first thing I get to MWC I get to organize plan the, the whole presence around it so it was a huge deal but you know you, what you 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 know you never know until you try and I, I tried I had made a lot of mistakes I learned from it and um, grew to love this um, this type of job even more. Okay, that's uh, <laughs> going a, a bit too long about that. Soon after, uh, about three years with Yola, I, um, it was a startup, uh, some things are very unstable, uh, financial situation wasn't the best, 
So I had a chance to join Red Hat. And it was actually thanks to a Sailfish OS community member who referred me to a job here that I joined Red Hat. So you know, it's all like coming together, this, this um, community involvement. So when I joined Red Hat, uh, initially I was the community manager for Manage IQ. It's a cloud management platform. Um, it's a relatively small community, so after a couple of years when they had more need in the Ansible community team to you know, help with the growing uh, community in, in, in the Ansible side of things, uh, I started to help with that as well. Um, yeah, so that, that's kind of my job, uh, career history type of thing. Uh, I've lived in four countries, as in I've had permanent residence in four countries across three continents. Uh, I've traveled to about 40 plus countries across the same three continents. I haven't ventured anywhere more south, like South America or, or Africa or even Australia, so I would love to do that someday. Uh, in my spare time, I play percussion in an amateur orchestra. Uh, my main uh, instrument is the timpani, these huge kettle drums that you have to tune and, and, and you're, you're like the, I'm the most hated person in the orchestra because everybody has to help me move these uh, huge drums. So. But uh, um, as a percussionist, you also have to be very versatile because not only do you just play one instrument, you have, I play everything depending on the piece, um, anything from the triangle to the snare drum to the xylophone to um, tuba labels to uh, cymbals, whatever, all kinds of um, things that you can hit and make weird sounds out of. So I think that I, I kind of like that, that the kind of variety of um, tasks and uh, different kind of, um, you know, not just sticking to one instrument. And I think that kind of helps also in this uh, job or career of being the community or developer relations person. So, all right, uh, and if you want to connect with me, just look for Saibat on Twitter, on uh, Freenode IRC, uh, Telegram, most of the common social networks. Okay. Okay, well, um, we're gonna talk about meetups, and well, today's talk is not specifically, specifically about the Ansible community. I'll be using many examples from um, my experiences this past year with the Ansible community and working with a, a lot of these meetup groups in the community. And uh, hopefully some of these experiences and uh, kind of ideas and thoughts can apply to generally other meetup groups as well. Um, so these are the uh, a kind of a map of not just meetups, but also contributors. We get information from GitHub uh, like uh, of the Ansible contributors and meetups ar across the world, you can see that um, in, it's, a lot of stuff is happening in the US. There's, you know, it's, it's quite dark green, a lot of contributors there, and it's also a lot of different meetups across uh, East and West Coast and also everywhere. But um, within Europe and Asia, there's some hot spots, but there's also like places like um, Russia and China. There are some contributors, uh, you know, it's not the lightest green, there are some, you can see that, but um, you know, there's no meetups there. You know, so like, why is that? Could it be, um, you know, maybe some of the, the contributors are not like lo located centrally in certain cities, or uh, just they don't have that culture of having meetups? So these are the things um, I get to explore in my job. Um, so, Ansible has around 130 sponsored meetups, which what, what it means is that we pay for uh, the meetup.com sub subscription and uh, for, for all these meetup groups, but uh, most of these meetups are run by community volunteers. So, there are some by, by Red Hatters, but generally we encourage community volunteers to run them. We just support them by paying for the subscription, for example, and helping them promote the meetups. And before I go on, I want to thank uh, Greg Sutcliffe uh, for doing all this data, made metrics, numbers thingy. Uh, he used to be the community manager for Foreman, if some of you might know, but he got uh, really uh, interested in 
and analyzing this uh, data stuff, and um, which is an important part of uh, community management. So he decided to focus on that, and helps me make sense of all these um, things, numbers, by finding the best way to display them nicely, to sort and filter them, and, and so on. Okay, so these are the top five largest meetup groups in terms of numbers for Ansible. Great numbers, thousands, three thousand, two thousand, whatever. Uh, it's, it's nice to say, hey, you know, I, I'm part of this largest meetup group in, in, in the world, largest Ansible meetup group in the world, or I organize it, or something like that. However, like, it's quite obvious that these are major metropolitan cities. I think any one of them uh, has a population larger than Finland, where, I, where I'm from. So it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's, while well, you have a large city, you have a lot of people, so it, generally you will have larger numbers when you say, open up a group and you know, invite people to join. So while we, we want to celebrate these groups, you know, it's great that they have this um, large uh, interest, but we cannot neglect the smaller ones as well that can be just as uh, interesting and effective. And for, for example, um, so my, my first assignment when I joined the Ansible team was to focus on the European meetups because I'm based here in Europe, so it's easier for me to do that. So uh, I, I did that for a while, and then I also took a look at, say, Sao Paulo in Brazil. It's a large group, it's one of the largest, top five, but they only had five previous meetups. And it happens to be every, every other year. Like they had some in 2015, and then 2017, and then 2019. One in 2019, one, one last year. And cu I'm curious, like, wh why is that? I have, have not had the chance to um, get in touch with them to, to ask about that. But um, you know, num numbers aren't everything. Numbers are first step to explore more behind that. So, you know, we, we can say it's, it's one of the top five, but is it the most active? Is it, is it the most, um, you know, interesting to join or things like that? And they don't always necessarily correlate. So, but that was one of the mistakes I did when I first started helping to organize these meetups in Europe. I fo first focused on, like, I, I listed the top 10 in Europe and I, you know, contacted the organizers and uh, asked them, what do they need? How, how, how can I help them um, be, be more effective in their meetups? But that, that is important, of course, but actually a lot of the times, some of the smaller ones could be more, uh, actually need more help um, and, and to be just, just as meaningful. So that's one number, just the number of members in the meetup group. This is probably a more interesting number the average RSVP, that means the number of people who said, yes, I want to attend this meetup. So in the last 12 months, basically most of uh, 2019, um, these are the top five groups with uh, the most average RSVP numbers. So now you see, it was previously it was Pune was, had the largest meetup group, but London actually has the largest RSVP numbers, uh, and Pune was second. And then, again, um, like Montreal and Munich, they are not even in the top 10 uh, in terms of the meetup size, but they are in the top five in terms of uh, average RSVP. So, you know, one number does not tell the whole story. And, and from there, here you can see like London and Pune, they are RSVP versus the total membership is about single digit percentage, 7%, 3% uh, at Paris as well. Whereas Montreal and Munich is 15% double digits. And then down the line, you have a really small, uh, recently um, uh, established meetup group. I think they started in August last year, already had three meetups. And uh, even though they, their average RCP is only 42, but it's 33% of their total membership. So that's like a much more active group because like, you know, one out of three who are in the, uh, in the group shows up to the meetup every time, so. So again, like just 
when you look at numbers, look at also compare like how, what is the context and how, what's relative to and things like that. And so, um, like I said, I, I was focusing on European meetups. We went from six active meetup groups, and I define active as having a meetup in the last six months. So when I first started, we only had six active groups. Maybe if I extended it to 12 months, we'll have more numbers, but I wanted to be more like strict. So six, six months, uh, within six months, we have a meetup, you are an active group. And I think at the beginning of this year, we are up to 12 active groups. Again, it's not large numbers, but having like 12 solid active groups, it's, you know, a, a, a kind of, it's kind of a boost to your community and, and to, to, to the kind of the spirit of um, a collaboration. So, and speaking of, um, if you're interested in helping to revive the Enspo Brno meetup, please come to talk to me after this. Because it, it has a large number of members, but it hasn't had a meetup since it first started in 2016 or 17, so. All right, so that was about Enspo meetup numbers and how uh, get using the numbers, uh, using the kind of data and metrics, I, I try to analyze and pick up meetups to focus on and help. And along the way, I learned a lot of things. And uh, again, we, let's take a look at the five Ws, why, who, what, when, and where. And um, these have very different answers or you know, responses depending on the group because Every group has different dynamics, different um, challenges. And as Lenka <coughs> mentioned earlier, you know, some groups here, uh, they are more focused on beginners. They help them with tutorials and workshops, whereas there are some groups that is like more for, for more advanced users. Um, so different dynamics, you have to think about different things. I will offer some Cs, like the letter C, in response to these Ws. I like the letter C because it's in my name, <laughs> and it's like, that represents community, so collaboration. So yeah, um, let's take a look at some of the C's the answers. So why, why do we have meetups? Anyone, why do you join a meetup group? Why do you organize one? Just shout out an answer. Hear interesting talks. Hear interesting talks, great. All right, what else? I'm sorry? Meet up with people, yes? Learn more from what you want to know and actually share what you know with the other. Great, learn what you want to know and share what, what you already know. Yeah, uh, you already summarized <laughs> what, what I have planned to say, so. <laughs> so no, 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 it's great, so I, have to, I can speak less. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, at first I put common passion or common interest. But I think um, passion or interest usually implies that you already involved in something or you already have some knowledge or at least some basic knowledge to have the interest. <laughs> so I decided to, 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 a better word would be common curiosity. Not just because it starts with C instead of you know, the other letters, but because sometimes it's just about, you know, you, you could see a meetup group in, in your neighborhood or in your lo local community and say, hey, I've never heard about this new technology. I want to learn something about it. You don't know enough yet to be, uh, to be interested or to be passionate about but you're curious, right? So, so sometimes that's the motivation as well. And for those who already have some knowledge, the, the, the passion is also the curiosity to see what else is there, what other people are using the technology for, what else you can learn from, um, new things that you, you have not th thought about or explored. So I think um, curiosity is a better word to kind of encompass that desire to learn and also even desire to share. Networking, expanding social circles, that, those were all my um, comments and uh, somebody also mentioned to, to kind of interact with people. I also put something to put on the CV, uh, which is what I did, like I mentioned, when I got fired by, oh, laid off by Nokia, fire is a bad word. <laughs> and um, I just got into organizing meetups uh, in my local region and um, so that could be something that helps you network, not just socially, but also professionally. Um, and also definitely sharing your knowledge, connect with like-minded people, and sometimes even to promote 
your product, your project, or your company. I mean, I help uh, community organizers to organize Ansible Meetup because I want to share the, um, you know, the knowledge of Ansible to, to the community. And um, yeah, back to curiosity. I think a lot of meetups, once they kind of have a, a kind of, a, how to say, um, have, have had several meetups and uh, uh, a lot of people already know each other and they have had, uh, talked about several topics. It's always good to come back and remember there might be people who are new to the group, who are new to the technology and have refresher courses, have uh, kind of newbie um, days once in a while, once every three or four meetups, so that you can actually welcome new members into your community. I mean, we want to grow the community, right? Not just uh, sustain the community. So um, it's always good to remember that. You will, we were all once noobs in whatever technology we're using now. So help that, uh, you know, help, help new people to come to join as well. So who, who, not just about who to target the meetups to, but also who can help organize the meetups and who to help promote and you know, there's a lot of people involved. Um, for example, when I want to, when we look, if we look at the map uh, earlier on with you know, the graph about, there are some countries with a lot of contributors but no meetup groups, why is that? Perhaps I could reach out to people I know in that area to start a meetup group or understand the reason they might not have one. Um, is there somebody I know within Red Hat who doesn't even have to work for Ansible team but has the desire to help uh, create a group? Um, actually, a lot of times we have uh, community members themselves just reach out to us and say, hey, we have a bunch of people here. It's just five or 10 people. Um, we kind of want to get together and talk about Ansible and uh, share ideas and teach each other stuff. We want to create a meetup group. Can we do that? And that's, you know, the, the uh, um, kind of music to my ears because that's, that's something that, it, you know, I, I, I really appreciate and definitely would, would help them set up things and give them some tips and everything. So. Um, oh, but coming to that point, always have some easy way to reach you on the website. Some, uh, you know, whether it's IRC or email address, have some prominent way to, so that you can be contacted if they want more information. And you don't have to know everyone. You, you can reach to your connections and ask them to connect more people. It's a network effect. So I, I don't know everyone, but I have a lot of help from a lot of people, from um, uh, different organizers from Tim who just walked in. He has been helping with the, a lot of the North American meetups because I'm not based there and he has been to a lot of them. So um, yeah, in, in, and also like you, when you want to get people to speak at your meetups, uh, you know, ask around, who, you know, do you know somebody, who knows somebody who might be able to talk about this topic? And also, um, pay attention to the people who are attending your meetups. Um, I mean, of course, the first time you may not know these people well, but as you, know, as you get more and more um, meetups uh, frequently, you start to know the, the people who are attending. Um, know, know what they, they might have certain requirements or certain needs. And I'll touch that a bit on diversity and inclus inclusivity later on. So that's all about the people who are in, involved in meetups and what? It's mainly about the content. What, what do you do in the meetup? What do you talk about? Um, and I think some meetups try very hard to fill up their whole session with like uh, you know, three or four talks or um, you know like uh, some full um, sessions or workshops, and that's great. Um, London is one example. They usually have at least three talks, usually four. Um, and they have actually like a whole PR submission process for uh, submitting a talk. They use a PR method. You go to GitHub, submit your pull request for your talk, and if it gets accepted, you can get to speak at the next meetup. 
Um, but there are also some meetups that have just one topic or one presenter per meetup. And there's no right or wrong way of doing it, just know what's the dynamics of your meetup group. Maybe it's a small, small city and um, it doesn't take too much effort to get from east to west, for example. And so people tend to meet more often and uh, you know, maybe just one or two hours at a time and that's fine. So you just you know, have one topic at a time. Whereas you know, perhaps in a bigger city, where you know, if, you, if you hold a meetup in West London, those from the East will be like, oh, I'm, I'm not gonna spend my hour getting there just for you know, a couple of hours of meetup. You might want to make it a bit more worth their while, so have more prog program planned. So things like, um, so, so keeping things concise sometimes helps more than trying to fill, fill up um, uh, with, with a bunch of uh, different talks. Uh, again, depending on what, you, what your meetup group is like. Speaking of GitHub repos, some use that, again, to uh, receive requests for talks, but do note that not everybody is comfortable using Git, so provide an alternative way just by email or by you know, some communication channel to, to accept the talk as well. And also, again, some, some meetup groups use GitHub to share the presentations afterwards and use, you post their videos on YouTube channels. Um, we, we don't di dictate that you have to do it a certain way, but if they want, we enable and facilitate them to, to do that. There's a github.com slash ansible-community. It's an unofficial community-managed repo where a lot of meetup groups post their content there. And one last thing, I think talks do not necessarily have to be technical in nature. It's great, uh, of course, like if you go to an Ansible meetup or Kubernetes or whatever, you expect to hear about the technology. Um, I attended one Ansible meetup in Dresden. After I, I did a general talk about what the, the Ansible community is about um, and uh, how I like to you know, work with them and some of the events coming up and touch a bit about um, Kubernetes operators using Ansible, but not, nothing like really technical and deep. At the end of it, one person came up to me and said, the developer relations people I know from other companies are more techni technical in nature. Why aren't you? I mean, I don't think he meant it as in a bad way, but I felt a bit like, darn, you know, like why, why, why was, am I not more technical? But I think that should not be the, the, the thinking. Because a lot of times, it's not just about being technical or not, but if you have that kind of expectation that everything must be really deep, really technical, you're also excluding the um, beginners, the, the people who are trying to learn the technology. So welcome the interesting deep, deep talk, dive talks, also welcome some more general um, kind of high level talks that, uh, or people just sharing their experience using it, not even developing for it. Just, you know, the, how much trouble they have with it. And actually through some of these you can say, oh, maybe this part, the user experience needs to be improved, for example. Or some, this, uh, for this part, the doc documentation can be, you know, uh, fixed to, to make things easier for the users. So, um, for example, I, I actually attended a Kubernetes meetup in Tambore. I mean, I know this much about Ansible, and I know nothing about Kubernetes. So they actually invited me to talk, and I'm like, what can I talk about? I know nothing about Kubernetes. Um, so I actually just shared my experience at KubeCon, the first KubeCon I attended in, I think it was Barcelona. And um, so I talked about the kind of community experience I've had there. I went to their contributor workshop thing. I, you know, attended some talks and tried to understand some things. So I shared all of these and also about the kind of people I met and so on and so forth. And they actually quite enjoyed my perspective, like, like from an outside, not really part of, you know, fully part of the Kubernetes community, outside looking in type of view. And then somebody um, kind of continued my talk with more concrete numbers of, you know, how, how many percent of their community is female, who are doing what, well, how many um, pull requests. So he, he kind of supplemented my talk 
um, for 10 minutes after that with some in, in more interesting figures. So, you know, like some, something, sometimes little things can drive discussions of other topics. So don't be afraid to um, talk about different things and also don't encourage people, if you're the organizer, encourage people to submit different kind of talks, not just, you know, technical deep dives. Um, uh, there was once at a web, web dev meetup, I, we heard, a, we saw a, a title of a talk, something about coffee, making coffee. So at first we thought maybe he's talking about Java because, you know, a cup of Java is a cup of coffee. But it turned out he got, he was really talking about making coffee, the coffee that we drink. It, it was actually pretty, pretty technical. He was talking about all kinds of brewing methods and the equipment he used. And um, it got everybody really interested, even though it was not about the, the web dev, web development meetup, I mean, the topic at all. But, you know, sometimes just a little change of direction or diversion could make things interesting. And during the break, everybody was, was talking about coffee and their experiences. So. Not, not saying that, you know, we have to talk about coffee every time, but once in a while that could be interesting. When? When do we have meetups? How often should we have it? It's a... Uh, there's, there's no right or wrong answers, or there's no good or bad answers. There are some meetup groups that have meetups every month. Um, like I said, sometimes a smaller group, that might be easier. You know, like uh, it's just uh, 10, 15 people, your schedules are easier to kind of um, uh, to, to, to sort out and find, find time where you, all of you can meet together. So, but having a regular time does make it easier to schedule and maybe also easier to find venues. If, if you know a venue that says, okay, maybe every two months we can, on, on a Wednesday, we can have, we can, you know, uh, accommodate you for the meetup. Um, once a month, well, sounds really great, but you know, it's not better or worse than having, say, once every three months. If it's a bigger group and you can't um, afford the luxury of ha having it so regularly. But the thing is, it's good to have a plan, you know, whether if you want to keep it once a month, once every three months, even once every four, six months, whatever. Because once you have kind of, once people kind of know the cadence, it's also easier for them to plan to uh, attend the meetups or if a speaker, for example, knows you have the meetup every two months and he, and he or she wants to speak, but he knows that, uh, oh, I can't make it to the next one, but maybe in the, the following one, I can make it. Let's make that happen. So you help to kind of uh, make things more, uh, you know, e easier to manage, easier to organize. So. If possible, if uh, some, some, some groups try to collect a bunch of speakers first and then try to find a location and a place, I mean, a, a date and a location, uh, that works for some groups. But I, I think a, lot, a, a, a few successful groups I know, they just set the date first. Okay, we're going to meet. We just had one uh, last week, so we're going to meet in two months on this date, uh, probably this location. So, because once you have a fixed date, it's easier when you start looking for speakers. They will know right away, okay, I can speak on this date or not. Then, then you're not trying to figure it out when you have like three or four speakers. So, but of course, that's, that's just a kind of a, a way of doing it. And uh, different groups may have different um, experiences and, and some works for others and not, not everyone, so. Um, but yeah, if, if you can keep it consistent, that's probably the easy, uh, the, the make things a lot easier. Where? <laughs> this is a hard one because a lot of times, because most of these meetups are free, right? We, we try to make it uh, accessible to everyone and um, it's, it's probably also hard to try to collect money from people and, and um, you know, you probably need some kind of organization, non-profit or whatever, but so free meetups still have a cost because a lot of times the venues are not free. The uh, refreshments are not free. And those are usually tied together. Um, so I, th I would say a lot of organizers spend the majority of their time trying to get a location and find sponsors. 
So um, if you work for a company that might have a spare room that um, the groups can use every week at a certain time after work, you know, offer that because it doesn't cost the company too much extra and um, that's something people can rely on and you are really uh, helping the community and people will have a good impression of your company as well. So um, it relates back also to the consistency of the schedule because when you have a consistent schedule, it's easier to approach a company and say, um, can we have your uh, meeting room every other month or so, every other month or the third Wednesday or something like that. Um, although consistency doesn't always, also, uh, doesn't always mean the same location every time, especially in a larger city like London or Paris, you might want to alternate locations so that you can cater to uh, more attendees. So the consistency may be like you alternate every other meetup. Um, if you have three locations, once, you know, one, one for every uh, third meetup, things like that. So try to keep the cost minimal or find sponsors uh, who can sponsor. Usually it's easier if it's the same place and uh, to sponsor the refreshments, same company. The cost also involves time to travel to the location. I just had uh, uh, somebody from Arlington, Texas uh, email the Dallas uh, meetup organizers um, about wh where they are having their meetups because I used to live in Dallas for 11 years, by the way. So um, <clears throat> Arlington is like 40 miles from Plano, which is where some, some of their meetups are being held. So, you know, like the cost of driving, the time and the uh, gas and everything could be, you know, not, not, not trivial to a lot of people. So perhaps if they have enough interest from people in the west part of uh, Dallas to have either different meetup group or have sometimes occasionally have meetups there. So um, yeah, so that a lot of different costs involved to consider. And um, which also brings me to the RSVP problem. I think a lot of you who either attend meetups or organize meetups will probably know is that, sure, you know, you have 100 people RSVP yes to the meetup, but only like 30, 40 show up. And you prepare food for the 100 people. And it's like, no, I'm not gonna bring like, you know, 50 sandwiches home, <laughs> you know, and, and you end up having to throw most of them away and it's really a, a waste. Um, there have been so many dis discussions and suggestions on how to solve this, and uh, if you have any good ideas, I will all years because, you know, charging people to come could be one, but uh, you, you, you exclude a lot of people who just say, oh, it's not free, I'm not gonna come, you know. Or you can say, oh, you pay five, five dollars, five euros, whatever, and when, when you attend, we'll give it back to you. Sure, but that's, that's a lot of overhead in terms of like dealing with money. How do you first accept the payment and how do you then get the cash and give it back or what, you know. So there's actually one group in uh, the Netherlands. Um, what they do is they don't have very frequent meetups. They have it once every three, four months. Uh, and they tend to plan uh, very long workshops. So they don't have it on the weekdays. They'll have it on Saturday and have it from like nine to five or something, nine, 10 to five, say. So, so, you know, the person giving the workshop spends a lot of effort to prepare that. And of course, they will order the food and have all the um, space, you know, because when you have workshop, you have to have space and outlets for computers and internet connection and everything. And, you know, 30 people sign up. And we have to limit that because, again, space considerations. And then 15 people show up. There are people on the wait list who didn't know, who, couldn't, who wanted to attend and they couldn't. And then you have these 15 spaces uh, wasted. So they, they actually came up with this um, plan that says, if you miss one meetup, you get a yellow card. If you miss two, you cannot attend the next two meetups. They, they have this whole spreadsheet to keep track, but it is basically to discourage people from missing meetups for no reason. Or, or at least signing up and not showing up. I mean, you could have a very good reason. If you, you know, like three days before you found out you have something important, you come attend the meetup, 
go change the RSVP. You know, it doesn't take that much, but people usually don't. So we want to discourage that and encourage more uh, responsible, um, you know, uh, responsibility for, for your presence at the meetups. So not an easy uh, problem to, to solve, but um, there are ways probably to either <laughs> guilt people or try, try to make, make things harder for, for them or something so that they, they'll think twice before uh, skipping a, a, a meetup. So those are some um, kind of, I, I, I guess I rebelled on for quite a bit, and uh, just some uh, ideas of, you know, meetups does not necessarily follow a certain pattern. It really depends on your communities. It really depends on um, what the audience in, in, in your local groups want. Uh, and, um, but we want to, you know, sometimes we think, okay, these are the same 20 people that shows up every time we have a meetup. How do we get more people interested? How do we, you know, include more, grow more? Um, uh, yeah, like, just, just be more, uh, have, have more people join us, be more interested. And uh, a, a part of it is about being inclusive, right? And uh, already at this conference, there are many great talks about uh, diversity and inclusion, so I'm not going to be you know, discussing too much in detail, but I'm just going to highlight some things that could, could kind of, you should kind of consider as you, for, for event planning and meetup organizing. So, um, it's not loading, you disconnect. Okay, what happened? Basically, it had a tweet. It's not showing. Okay, I have to fall back on my PDF probably. Hang on. <laughs> Okay, good to have PDFs. Mm, let's see, okay. There we go. Okay, is it too? Does that work? Yes. All right. Okay. <laughs> so, um, special needs. This, I saw this tweet uh, yesterday, that, uh, two days ago at the start of the conference. Um, Anastasia tweeted that, um, you know, is there a place or a room that we, I can breastfeed? Uh, of course, um, I'm not saying for meetups you have to consistently like, have a room set aside for this. But say, for example, if you know in advance, somebody, like as you go, get to know your community. Oh, somebody just had a child. But hey, you see uh, his or her name on the uh, RSVP list that uh, they will be attending the meetup. Reach out to them, ask, is there, uh, oh, you know, congratulations of your, on your uh, recent uh, new child, and is there anything we can help? I see that you're attending the meetup, and is there anything we can help to make your meetup experience uh, more comfortable and easier? So, yeah, you don't have to have a reserve a room every time, but be observant and kind of proactive to reaching out. Hard of hearing and hard of seeing is something that we don't see very much, but I actually have heard people talking about, and I've seen tweets of people who are hard of hear hearing, especially, who attend the conferences and some of their challenges. If you know somebody like that who is attending your meetup, uh, remind the presenters to add more text, for example, for those hard of hearing, so it's helpful. My slides today are not very good for that because it's just one word <laughs> on every slide, but if I knew somebody who was hard of hearing, I would probably add more text, or at the end of the, the, the presentation, or even be before the presentation, share the speaker notes, for example. And when you upload the uh, videos, add captions, or at least speak clearly so that the auto captions uh, can work very well. 
And uh, I'm almost at, <laughs> at the end, thanks. <laughs> For hard of seeing, again, um, speak clearly, so because they don't have the visual cues to help them understand what, what's going on. And use less images, or if you use images, describe them. I will say, like, you know, this is a tweet of, uh, by Anastasi of her, herself holding a baby, and the caption is this. So if you are the person who, is, who has some special needs attending a meetup, don't hesitate to reach out to the organizers because most of, probably most of the time they, they, they want to help but they, they don't know, they, they can't help you if you, they don't know what, what your needs are. So um, some of this can be easily done if people are aware. And uh, oh, now it's, I think I have the other slide. All right, so other considerations. Um, some are really easy, like food allergies. Just in the meetup, just have a question at the end. If you have any food allergies, please contact this person or you know, email me or whatever. So, and also try to have at least some vegetarian options, some uh, you know, gluten-free and certain most common allergies so, so you can cater to most people. But of course, on the reverse side, that means there's a responsibility for the a responsibility on the attendees to show up so that we won't waste food. So both sides have to cooperate. Beverages. We love to talk about, you know, yes, let's have a meetup and go for beer and pizza. I mean, I myself, I'm guilty of that. But, you know, please consider a lot of people actually don't drink alcohol for many reasons. And they don't have to say why, but, because, um, but you know, it's, it's hard for sometimes for people to ask, why isn't there any other options besides beer and cider or whatever? So provide at least a couple of uh, non-alcoholic options. It's not that difficult. Coffee and tea could always work. Water, one or two juices. So, and I think most, more and more meetups and uh, events I attend have, are, are very, pretty good at this now. So it's, it's not like the, the a really kind of thing to watch out for, but you know, just have a checklist so that you don't miss stuff like that. Language, uh, I'm not talking about swear words, although there's really no need to swear because it's not in the lexicon of technology terms, generally. <laughs> but uh, I'm talking about the, the, you know, whether it's in English or Czech or Polish, the presentation language. It, de it depends on the audience. Actually, some local meetups, they have their meetups in their local language. I've been to a Polish meetup. Previously, they, were, they had all their meetups in Polish, but they, they made their meetup in English for, uh, because I was there, and I was really grateful. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's nice to, to be included that way, but also I was, more to, there to support them and, and not necessarily their target audience and it would have been fine if they had the presentation in Polish and perhaps the slides in English. And that's how certain meetups do it as well. They will have um, the slides in English and then the presenter can speak in what, whichever language he's comfortable, he or she is comfortable in. Um, so yes, uh, similar uh, for those, um, for, for catering, um, for, for including those who are hard of hearing. Uh, put more information in sl slides, uh, speak clearly so that, you know, if there's any auto-translate tool in YouTube or whatever, it, it can translate um, language uh, pretty well. So those are <coughs> that. Oh, I had more notes. Um, these three are actually you see right here in DAFCONF. You have the communication stickers, ye uh, yellow for only want to speak to friends, green and red and so on, and lanyards for if you want to, your photos taken or not, and gender pronouns. And that's great, but also um, if you're the organizer, please communicate the differences clearly. Last year what happened was I saw black lanyards and red, red lanyards. There was no labels on them. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. So I was like, 
I'm Chinese. Red is a lucky color for me. I'm grabbing a red one. And there was zero photos of me in the whole like, uh, album of a thousand pictures or something. So <laughs> I'm not saying like, hey, everybody take pictures of me, but I, I didn't have the problem with having my pictures taken. But because at, at that point, they, they forgot to label, they didn't have a chance to label those lanyards yet. I just grabbed one. Because culturally, red is cool for me. You know, it's like attention seeking, and in, instead, it's the opposite effect. So communication is quite important. Written form, whatever. Just make sure that the, the, the person understands what the different light, uh, colors or different uh, symbols mean when, when you have that um, for, for, for uh, consideration. Uh, finally, OK, I know I'm out of time. I want to make an analogy to Rain Leander and Mary Tangwell's presentation yesterday, who went to the one about Four Pillars of Support in DevRel, the developer relations, yes. So um, they mentioned like, you know, individuals, man maintainers, project, and community. So especially between individuals and maintainers, I want to make an analogy that meetup organizers are like the code maintainers. They do a lot more, and they are um, usually, um, you know, like they have their own full-time job, but they are also like organizing community meetups. So reach out to them, or if you are in a position like me who are assisting different um, meetups around the world or, or, or in different regions, maintain good contact with the organizers. They are the ones who, helps, who, are, who, who are key to helping you build your community. They are just, just like the maintainers of the project. So take care of your participants, but take even better care of your organizers. And I think, yes. Thank you, and questions, comments, criticisms, tomatoes. <laughs> yes. I have a question about the small element of the meetups because uh, the ones that I follow in Spain, they are more like conferences. Okay. Uh, Yeah, okay. So the yeah, question is about the format of meetups. Uh, in Spain, you said that you tend, they tend to be kind of conference, more conference in nature, very kind of, um, so I guess, formal format where somebody is up here speaking and everybody just listening, whereas there are certain meetups that's more casual and people just kind of hang around and chat. And I do notice that I actually looked at some of the US meetup groups and, well, sure, they, they will have one or two uh, talks at, at this meetup. The next meetup is like, okay, happy hour at bar X, you know, like, so I would say, again, there's no one standard or one format. If you want to have a more social meetup, perhaps you can either um, uh, propose to your organizer or start one yourself and um, see the response and, and because, um, I'm sure you're not the only one who, who would want to uh, experience that kind of meetups. So if you can find some like-minded people to do that, organize your own meetup. Um, if, you, if you know the topic of the project, for example, if it's Ansible related, you can talk to me. If it's uh, Kubernetes related, there might be you know, contacts you can reach out to to help uh, to get something set up for the meetup group. Uh, like like the, the tools used, or yeah, or places where they are. Uh, that's probably a whole other talk. I mean, mo uh, we are using Meetup.com, but you know, there's many different websites. Uh, Eventbrite is probably used for something <laughs> a bit more formal, where you you want to have registration and everything. There is people sometimes just hanging out in uh, RC or some 
chat group that say, hey, let's meet every Friday to have a drink and talk about this. So uh, again, there's, there's no one formula, but if you know who you, you might, who, who might be interested to, to join that, reach out to them, talk about what's the best way to plan that. Yes. Yeah, to, to oh, what? Uh, last question. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Good point, surveys. I mean, it's, you always want people to, to give you feedback, but some people may not feel comfortable face-to-face -face or whatever. So have surveys, reach out to them, get some ideas what, what you can do better. Great. <laughs> I'm not going to repeat that, but we're out of time. We can talk. Yeah. Thank you so much.